Does this offend you? The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Do you wish to also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I think it's a more or less accurate statement to say that it is increasingly more difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. From the truth to those things that appear to be true. And of course, the whole emergence of artificial intelligence is not helping. How many news articles have you heard where the pictures that you see online are actually not real? They were generated by machines for all intents and purposes. And of course, it's easier to deceive people because that is what the inability to tell fact from fiction or truth from not so true does. It deceives. It's easier to deceive people when we already have a social distance from them. Let me ask you a question as a test. How many of you actually know your neighbors? That's good. How many of you know your neighbors three or four houses down? How many of you know your neighbors six blocks over? Okay, so if you notice, the more distant we go from our own homes or our own houses, the less we know. Now let's magnify that into a world where not a lot of people even though, well, many people live in big cities, but they're cubed into two apartment blocks. And where many of us, on any given day, spend at least, I don't know, two or three hours staring at a device like this. The more impersonal we become as a world, it's easier for us to not tell the truth. White lies magnify themselves. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, what does the truth have to tell, uh, have to do with what Jesus is teaching us today? And I would like to argue that it has everything to do with what Jesus is teaching us today, especially if we believe Jesus to be the way, the truth, and the life. And... This past few weeks, we've been hearing of what Jesus, or been hearing and understanding what Jesus has been telling us all along. That he is the bread of life. That he is the bread that has come down from heaven. And that this is bread of life and bread that has come down from heaven is not just about physical bread, but really more about a relationship with him and the Father, an intimate relationship such that he knows us inside and out, such that he knows all our secrets, all those things that we are ashamed of, those things that we would rather prefer to stay hidden. Jesus knows them and wants to know them, and in spite of him knowing them, he says, I love you and you belong to me. 
Now, sometimes, because we have focused so much on the bread part, we missed out on the second. We missed out on the fact that the bread is really just there to ease us into relationship. That is why in the 1960s, MLK, Martin Luther King, was quoted as saying that this hour of day on a Sunday is probably the most segregated hour in America. Why? Because as Christians, we can't quite agree on what that bread is. Is it a symbol? Is it Jesus himself? Is it just a piece of bread? We can't quite agree. And so we also then miss out on our possible enriching of our relationship with each other. Now, <coughs> Jesus' statement that he was, that he is the bread of life, he's the bread that has come down from heaven, was a difficult thing to hear. We heard of the resistance to Jesus' message. And resistance is not uncommon when we are dealing with the truth. Why? Because the truth sometimes challenges pre-existing beliefs that we have. In the case of the hearers of Jesus, of course, they were shocked when they heard, well, what, what do you mean Moses didn't give them the bread from heaven? It clearly says it in the, in the Torah that, you know, Moses caused the manna to come down from heaven. And of course, Jesus corrected them and said, well, you know, actually, Moses was just the instrument. It came down from my father. Jeez, where'd that come from? How many times did you face the new truths in your own lives and said, geez, that's not, that couldn't be possibly true. It couldn't be possibly true that I'm doing things wrong all this time. Resistance is part of truth telling. And sometimes resistance is the first reaction that we have when we are told something new about ourselves. But you see, much as we would like to resist, the truth is that if we want to grow in our love for Jesus, if we want to grow in our relationship with anyone, we require some level of cleaning, of transformative change. Think about the relationships that you have formed in your own lives. And how many of those relationships you attempted to change the person with whom you are in love? Or the other way around, when you acquiesced because somehow they got to you in a way that no one else has gotten before, and you said, well, you know, and even though you pushed my buttons, I still love you. That is the nature of the relationship. It's like any relationship that we have is not built on superficialities. If you did, they wouldn't last, right? See, relationship building, I've found, is similar to repainting an old piece of furniture refinishing a new, an old piece of furniture. For those of you who are handy, you just don't put a fresh coat of polyurethane on something like this. Why? Because when the elements come, when the temperature changes, what will happen? The new coat will start to buckle. And next thing you know, Whatever you spent in the polyurethane goes to waste, right? So what do you do? You go and take the extra step of saying, you know what, I think I need to sand it down. And if there's any imperfections in the surface, what do you do? You put a little bit more wood filler. 
And then you sand it again. Just enough so that the new layer of polyurethane will stick. That's what's happening here. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to. If we want the deeply personal and lasting relationship with God, then somehow we must accept the truth that he offers, that he is madly in love with us, and we must enter that constant process of refinishing, where we take away those old layers of superficial pretensions that we might have, allow them to be sanded away by word, by sacrament, by the example of others, by the challenge of this very community for us to live into our better selves, and then encounter a more genuine relationship with God in the process. And sometimes that involves telling the truth. As St. Paul says, speaking the truth but not just speaking the truth and leaving us bruised, but speaking the truth in love. Now, why is this important? It's important because we live, as I've said, in a world where it's more difficult to tell truth from not so truth. It's easier to lie nowadays. It's easier to be duplicitous. And we live in a world that is quickly changing. And when we see things change around us, sometimes, just in the same way that we eat with our eyes, we can be influenced by many things. And we can go with those things instead of our relationship with God. One of the ways we engage in the process of purification is by renewing the covenant. That is what we heard in the first lesson today. The people were getting ready to enter the promised land, and Aaron was giving them fair warning. You will see many new things in where you're going. But as you enter this new, th new land and see new things, you have to choose whom you will serve. Will you remain faithful to the God of your ancestors, or will you acquiesce to the new things that you see? And isn't that the truth in our relationships as well? Yeah, we have our commitments to our better half, to our spouses, but, you know, some things, sometimes someone else new comes along. Do we then necessarily just go with the latest thing that comes along? Or do we say, no, I do have a ring. <laughs> I, I do have the promise to love and to hold from this day forward until, day, until death do us part. So we need this transformative change to sustain our relationship because Change happens, and we need gentle reminders. And the second thing is this. It's important because we want to build relationships with depth. How many of you still have best friends with whom you are close from the time you were this small? Good. How many of you keep in touch with them? And when that happens, do you have that feeling that somehow you can just pick up where you left off? Isn't that amazing? You know, when somehow you haven't seen each other for the longest time, although you've kept in touch by phone, but it seems that you can just easily pick up where you left off. And that's a sign of a lasting relationship. And for that to happen, for, those th for that level of intimacy to take place, we need to do what St. Paul was telling us in the second lesson. Yes, St. Paul was all about like arming yourself with all these elements of armor. 
That's good symbolism. But in the end, what he's really telling us that we need to be rooted in the word so that we can be strengthened interiorly as the word transforms us interiorly. But we also need to put on those, those, the armor of the Lord. And sometimes the armor of the Lord is manifested in how we conduct our lives based on what we believe. It's not just vestments. It's how our belief shapes our action. So, I have to rely on notes today. When we then are able to sustain relationships, when we're able to ground ourselves in Jesus himself, what happens? It's less difficult not to tell the truth, right? It's when we have a relationship with someone, do we hide things from them? Do we, unless of course it's a, a big, or it's, a, it's a, p- a piece of Tiffany jewelry and you want to surprise them, that's a different story. But when th- things happen in your life, do you hide it from them? Probably not. Probably they're the ver- first person you would like to tell that somehow something good has happened in your life. See, that's the level of relationship that God wants with us. Our ability to tell God, you know, I really have a bad day. I'm really having a difficult time in prayer. I'm really finding it difficult to believe that you're still journeying with me after all this time. If all we bring to God is the nicer parts of our lives, then God's probably saying, cut to the chase. I know that already. What I need you to bring to me are those things that are really in your heart. Because that is where I want to be with you. So that I can bring grace and and transformation there. We concluded our gospel today with Peter's confession of sorts. Lord, to whom shall we go? In a way, what... Jesus was, what Peter was was telling Jesus was, okay, you caught me. I was trying to do other things, but you caught me. You got me. And it's not like I got you in a bad way. It was more like a resignation in saying, Lord, you know me through and through. You know me with my hair down when I don't have, you know my vulnerable moments. Who else can I go but you? And for us, it is an invitation to realize what's really important. The things that we see changing around us or the relationship that we have with Jesus. And I hope as we face the many challenges in our lives, we will have the confidence to say to Jesus, Lord, who else can I turn to? You know me through and through. You know when I stand up or when I sit down. You know me when I'm having a good day or a bad day. And I know that you love me. And I know that you're concerned for me. May we have that level of confidence to turn to Jesus, to turn to this community of faith through which hopefully we encounter Jesus himself and come to him and say, Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. And to that God who journeys with us and loves us in the midst of our vulnerabilities, to that God be glory and honor now and forever. Amen.